everyone, it's Paul at the Garland County Library, and tonight's presentation is called Bug Bites, an Introduction to Insects. And in this overview of the various groups of six-legged arthropods that we share our planet with, you're going to learn bites of info about the bugs that we live with and sometimes on us. And tonight features a returning guest presenter, Belinda Jonak, who is an Arkansas master naturalist, and she's quirky and knowledgeable and always gives a good program. So hello, Belinda. Hi, Paul. My old Hi, Paul. <laughs> All right, turning it over to you. Okay. All right. Um, I've got a strictly introductory program, and we will switch it over to slides now. Okay. Yeah, it's there. Just hit present. All right. Okay, so um, entomology is a huge field and it's the specialty of studying insects and most entomologists pick a particular area in which to focus their attention and research. Um, economic entomology is the biggest, oh, I shouldn't say that really, but it's the most lucrative. <laughs> Um, all right, for example, uh, many insects are used in advertising. Many insects are economically important. Um, honeybees, for example, because they make honey and they also are important for pollinating agricultural crops. There are lots and lots of people that specialize in the study of honeybees. They're not native, but economically speaking, they are significant. And some people are in the pest control business. Um, they look at uh, controlling fire ants, for example. Um, some people look into um, researching mosquitoes because mosquitoes obviously are uh, vectors for disease. They carry some important diseases and um, wasps can go either way. There are some beneficial wasps and there are some wasps in places that people don't necessarily want them. But there are many, many varieties, species, insects are just huge. Okay, and to determine what an insect is, there are some simple structures, some simple features that you can check on and discern whether or not what you're looking at is an insect. Okay, so the first one is obviously not an insect. It has way too many legs. Um, you're looking at a millipede. These are harmless. They can't bite. They can't really do anything. They just feed on uh, detritus, decaying material. Not an insect. Um, house centipede, way too many legs, not an insect. Now, if you look closely, there are three in the front actual legs. Now, a caterpillar is an immature insect. It looks like there are more legs, but these are actually called prolegs. And when the caterpillar changes into a butterfly, only these the front legs will be the true legs. So it actually has six legs. It is an insect, but it is an immature insect. So yes, if it's got six legs, that's a good indication that what you're looking at is an insect. Okay, and you're looking at for body parts too. So if it has one big blob of a body, it has too many legs also. This is a tick, not an insect. If it has just two main body segments and eight legs, no, not an insect, spider. Okay, it's not always terribly clear, but there is a distinct division between the head and the thorax. It's got a head, it's got a thorax, it's got an abdomen, Yes, you're looking at an insect.
Now, some insects do not have wings, but the vast majority have at some point in their life cycle wings. Okay, so if you're looking at a pill bug, for example, pill bug, wood louse, uh, roly poly, this has tons of names, but it has lots of, way too many legs. It has more than six legs, not an insect. No wings. Bark scorpion has too many legs, only two main body segments, no wings. It's a scorpion. It is not an insect. You have a distinct head, thorax, an abdomen, wings, six legs. Yes, insect. Okay, I'm going to go through a few technical terms and names just to start out with. I'm going to go pretty fast through these. Um, and I just picked, okay, there are actually around 30-ish, depending on the taxonomist you're looking at, um, 36 orders of insects. Now, some things are pretty easy, some not so much. Um, but most insects, you can get them to order with just a few key features. So I'm just going to uh, run through. I selected some of the more common orders. And um, Ephemeroptera, Odonata, Isoptera, Orthoptera. Now, Orthoptera has been split into some smaller, depending on the taxonomist. Again, uh, this is an older system but Orthoptera may, may be split into uh, more families in some systems. Um, Siphonoptera, Neuroptera, Hemiptera, Lepidoptera, Diptera. Those are just some of the names for the orders of insects. That's a large group. You got um, for a species, two names, genus and species, an order includes large groups. And for some individuals, what you're looking at, order may be the best you can do without really studying. The biggest order, coleopteras, beetles, well, flies may, giving, may be giving them a run for their money, but uh, as of right now, Coleoptera is the biggest order in terms of species. Hymenoptera. Okay, some other terms that come in handy, useful terms. Um, immature insects, larval insects have um, names like nymph. A lot of the aquatic insects are nymphs or naiads. Um, when you have uh, an insect changing or growing, uh, it'll molt and get bigger, molt and get bigger, and those molted stages are called instars. And usually the immature of the moths and the, and the butterflies are going to be called caterpillars. Maggots are baby flies. Grubs are usually baby um, beetles. And some of those beetle grubs can get quite large. These are... Um, beetle grubs, and uh, from another uh, aspect, maggots. These are um, fly maggots that are been, being used uh, in a medical application. They're still used to clean uh, hard-to-heal wounds, uh, diabetic uh, uh, ulcers and bed sores. They may still use maggots to do uh, a debridement to clean hard to heal wounds. So they're medically important still. Okay. Ephemeroptera are aquatic and this is the larval. So if you're in a, a, a lake, stream, pond, and you see an insect, and a lot of times these will be on uh, or under rocks, but this is a larval mayfly. This is what they spend, the form they spend most of their life in. Um, 
they're kind of flat looking with tails on the end. When they emerge, they look like this as adults. They can't bite. They don't really have functional mouth parts. Ephemeral means brief. They only live a day, a week. Most of them don't make it past a few weeks, but their only function once they change from the aquatic immature form is to mate and lay eggs, and then they die. And they hatch usually in huge numbers. Sometimes you'll see them just coating light fixtures and all over trees and shrubs. But they shed their skin to become this winged form. They do a mating flight and then they lay eggs and die. A short life. And the other really obvious, well, this is a, an easy to identify group, uh, the order Odinata, Odinata. Uh, Odinates are dragonflies and damselflies and the adult forms, you see them near water and the larval form, the nymphs or naiads are aquatic and very different from the adult form. But this is a larval dragonfly. This is a larval damselfly. They'll be found in uh, streams, rivers, ponds. Um, I really like this one. This is an ebony jewel wing. They're absolutely gorgeous. When the light hits them, they, they glint. They have this metallic sheen and velvety black wings. This is a male. But an ebony jewel wing is a damselfly that's just really gorgeous. Um, and when they mate, this is a different species, but they form this mating structure that looks a little like a heart. Really neat critters. Oh, um, some people call these mosquito hawks, but they are, somebody was asking me about mosquito control. If you have a lot of damselflies and dragonflies, uh, they love to eat mosquitoes but they'll pretty much eat any sort of smaller insect. And sometimes they'll eat a fairly large insects too. They're hard to catch. They're extremely good flyers and handsome animals. All right, and termites are a social insect. Now we have a whole bunch of the same insect um, but they take different forms. Okay, so you got a big female here. This is the queen, and she lays eggs, and that's pretty much her only function. Um, this is one of the soldiers. Um, they've got big mandibles, and they serve to protect their nest. Now, I was trying to remember. I'm not sure if this is Australia or Africa, but this big tower, and you can tell uh, about the size because the people standing next to it, but it's it's well over six feet big termite mound. But in some parts of the world, they do get um, really huge mounds, but they eat pretty much all plant material um, and you know they're known for the damage they do to wood structures. Um, when it comes time for them to uh, split and make new colonies, they um, produce winged forms. So um, as, <clears throat> as they mature or when they light and establish a colony, they lose their wings, but they make a mating flight, the drones and uh, the females, and they do have wings. And then they settle down, the female mates, and they start uh, a new colony. And in some parts of the world, they are a food source. Lots of animals eat them and people can eat them too. They are considered a delicacy in some places. But they've got um, the queen and the soldier. And this one shoots out the sticky glue too. These are defensive forms. Uh, 
And this, okay, Orthoptera for sure are going to be grasshoppers, katydids, crickets. And some places uh, divide the mantids into their own group and the cockroaches are in their own group. Uh, but some places clump these into one big family or one big order, actually. And most people have run across cockroaches. I get tickled about people say, oh, it's a water bug. Well, it's a cockroach. Um, but here we've got a pretty common uh, for this part of the south. I mean, they're all over the south. But these are our native cockroaches. And some of them can get up to pretty good size. But they're harmless. They don't bite. They're just an annoyance more than anything. And these, the mantids, uh, we have a few different species of um, praying mantis, but they've got these scythe-shaped front uh, legs that are really uh, good at capturing prey. They can, they can take a pretty good sized insect, and some of them get quite large. And these stick insects, uh, I don't think this is one of our species. This is a Asian, I think, and it's got kind of thorns. But a lot of the stick insects, that's exactly what they look like. They look like sticks, walking sticks, and we've got some that get quite large. But yeah, they're, they're herbivorous, totally harmless. Okay, and the quote, real orthopterans, the ones that are definitely in the order orthoptera are gonna be um, the grasshoppers. And I got interested in this color phase because you usually see green katydids, but they do come in occasionally yellow and sometimes pink and red. They're not as common because they show up. I guess if you if they hit in a crepe myrtle, they might be well camouflaged, but usually um, you see the green ones. But the orthoprins have the big jumping legs and um, sometimes the grasshoppers are really brightly colored and have some uh, fancy wings, but um, when they jump and spread their wings, they'll fly a short distance and then close their wings pretty quickly. And it makes them, you see the bright flash pattern. And But when they land on the ground, they fold up and it, you may have to look around to find them again. And crickets are also quite common. This is one of the underground, this is a mole cricket. They've got modified front legs so they can dig. They're kind of cute. And pretty much nobody appreciates fleas. I like the little rhyme, though. I uh, found this in one of the kids' books. Let us fly, said the flea. Let us flee, said the fly. So they fled through a flaw in, a, in the flu. Um, but yes, fleas jump quite well. And they have a life cycle. They start as eggs. The larval are, looks like kind of worm-shaped um, and go through a couple of different molts. Um, but they're pretty much all parasites, and a lot of them have developed resistance to uh, the pesticides used to control them. They are persistent little stinkers. But they do have piercing, sucking mouth parts. But Fleas are easy. Nothing else really looks that much like a flea. There's a flea beetle, but it doesn't really, these are flattened. Mm, yeah. Fleas are easy. Okay. Neuroptera is a smallish group, um, but they're all good pest control. Um, if you have lace wings or antlions around, um, they're good for taking care of aphids. So if you've got smaller insects that are uh, on your vegetables, lace wings and antlions are nice to have around. They are especially good at eating aphids. This one right here has an aphid in its jaws. The mandibles are 
have closed. And they um, lay unusual eggs. If you find on the underside or um, of a leaf, and it looks like these little filaments with the white dots at the end, those are going to be lacewing eggs. But the lacewings as adults and as a larval form, the adult form is a, a pretty delicate little thing, but it has a nice set of mandibles. And this is the larval form. <clears throat> and antlions, this is the adult. And almost everybody who lives in the South has seen these before. If you find kind of a dry, uh, dusty, sandy area that doesn't get much rain, you might find these little pits. And at the bottom of these little pits, you'll see this. If you blow on it, you'll see maybe the jaws sticking out at the very bottom. But this is an ant lion. And they just wait at the bottom of this pit trap. And sometimes if something wanders close, they'll flip, they'll flick uh, grains of dust and sand at it, knock them down so they can bite. Uh, but uh, yes, it's, it's an ant trap. But yes, um, the larva looks quite different from the adult. But uh, there are several different names. I've heard them called doodlebugs, but uh, I guess really the more appropriate name is antlion. All right, hemiptera. Here are the quote true bugs. When you say bug, to an entomologist, he thinks of, or they, the entomologist will think of this group, this order, the hemiptera. Uh, they have piercing, sucking mouth parts, and it is quite a large, diverse group. There's a, like stink bug. This is a, um, I think, brown marmorated stink bug. Um, this one is one of the assassin bugs, and that piercing, sucking mouth part. It's got hold of an inchworm here and it's it's sucking its innards out. Uh, yes, these are predators. Some of them suck sap and uh, are plant pests and some of them are predators. And this one is definitely a predator, as is this one. Um, and these are pretty common around here. They're called wheel bugs. They've got kind of this uh, arched structure along the back, but it's got that long piercing mouth part um, and there are a few that are bloodsuckers. This is the old bed bug, a pest. It's, this is blown up considerably, but they're flattened and uh, definitely in the pest group. And these are um, kissing bugs. Uh, these actually are bloodsuckers also. Uh, there are several that look similar to this. And I'm not sure that we actually have this species here, uh, but uh, this one and this one are both uh, bloodsuckers. And this is an aquatic bug, true bug. Um, you may have seen skating around on the surface, um, and they dive pretty good too, but it's a water boatman. And um, you find these pretty much exclusively floating on the surface of ponds and streams. And you've heard these guys, but um, cicadas are hemipterans too. And I think this was is a 13-year cicada. Now, some people call them locusts, but really locusts are uh, like an old name for grasshoppers. So cicadas is, is correct. Um, and these do um, like a, a life cycle that includes usually several years. I think that, yeah, this one's a 13 year and there's a 17 year. There's uh, several different species and they have different um, different time periods in which they sp spend as um, immatures. Um, but they spend their immature time um, buried underground and they suck sap from plant roots. They're usually, you know, not terribly destructive unless you get a you know, real infestation. You have a whole lot on the same plant. The tree roots, and usually they're harmless to the tree, that is. And to us, too, uh, they're kind of, mm, 
aside from being noisy, they're just harmless. They emerge in huge groups. I think we've got a brood X, brood 10. I'm not sure we've got a second 17 year here. We've got 13 years locusts here. I think this is the one. But when they emerge from underground, they'll climb up um, on the side of the tree. It's on a, on a plant. They'll get, they'll get high. They'll crawl up and they'll emerge and this look kind of soft and white and they leave behind the exoskeleton and you know, almost everybody who's been out anywhere have seen these things hanging from trees. Um, and this goes through the actual process where the, um, the insect is emerging and you can see the wings, it, they pump fluid into the wings and expand and they're really light colored at first, kind of a pretty soft green but they get uh, darker as they harden. And they are edible. There are uh, quite a few places that they're on the menu. And there's some recipes here. I think a lady from North Carolina uh, puts up some recipes for fixing cicadas and lots of different things um, will eat them. So let's see, saw a squirrel eat one. Ordinarily, you don't really think about squirrel as eating insects, but these things are so easy to catch. A lot of things take advantage of them, but uh, they have the strategy like the mayflies do. Huge numbers emerging, way more than the predators can eat. But that racket they make, that stridulation, um, that scraping um, high buzz they have um, is a mating call. They're signaling to each other um, so that they can mate and lay eggs. Okay, and gardeners, nobody likes aphids in, because they are neat, but they're little soft-bodied insects, tiny little squirts, and um, but they have a reproductive cycle that's really short. They can make lots of babies really fast and uh, invade your vegetation. Um, but most insects do lay eggs, but these guys have an egg laying option or they can have live young fast. But the little projections on the rear end and they're sort of round, tiny. And the other interesting thing about them is as they feed and they have a piercing sucking mouth part, they, uh, they drink the sap and if you get a lot of them, they'll, yeah, they'll ruin your plants. But as they drink, they exude uh, kind of a sweet, sticky stuff called honeydew. And the ants really like it. And a lot, there are several different groups of ants that treat them like livestock. They will protect them. They will move them around. Uh, but they are attracted to the honeydew. They eat the honeydew that the aphids exude. Um, and, and yeah, pretty much treat them like we would cows and livestock. So it, it's an interesting relationship that is developed between the two entirely different uh, groups of insects. Okay. And these are another kind of pest group for the most part. But if you see these blobs, kind of uh, white, woolly, and there is, uh, they're called uh, cottony cushion scale. Uh, there are some aphids that are kind of woolly too, uh, but they look uh, kind of fuzzy, but they exude the stuff that disguises the actual insect, which is underneath. And they um, make these little shells that are sort of like uh, limpets, but they can cling really tightly to the plant, but they're, they're another um, agricultural pest. Um, and in this case, um, they are also raised. I think they're still, I know they are, uh, still cultivating them in Mexico, um, but um, the prickly pear cactus will develop these uh, like white blotches and under those blotches are gonna be a little insect. And this little cochineal bug um, is uh, has like red fluids and uh, they're still raised and processed for a dye 
uh, a crimson dye. And it's used, I think, still in food, uh, some food colorings, uh, but a lot of it's in uh, uses in um, dyeing fabric and paint. But it's uh, it's safe for a food coloring too, I think. Okay, Lepidoptera, the poster children of the insect world. And pretty much everybody is familiar with monarchs. Now this shows the different stages, but it doesn't look like, oh, uh, I didn't include a milkweed, um, but they're obligate um, users of milkweed. They have to have a milkweed plant to reproduce. But this is what they look like uh, as an adult, a caterpillar and a chrysalis. The chrysalis um, that they um, metamorphose in, that they change into a butterfly in, is just gorgeous. It's kind of a pale jade green with little gold dots along the top. It looks like jewelry, it's so pretty. Uh, But they've got programs where they've put little tags on them so they could follow them. Um, some populations migrate. It takes them two or three generations to do it, but um, they will uh, fly all the way. Uh, some, some populations get all the way to uh, the border of Canada. They, they go pretty far north. Uh, and then they make a migration back um, like the third or fourth generation, and they go to Mexico, and then they uh, overwinter in this uh, fir forest in Mexico in huge numbers. It's really a National uh, Geographic special. She had um, really nice footage of them uh, going to the trees in Mexico. Okay, and the other lepidopterans are moths. Um, this is a really pretty luna moth, and these eye spots on the back wings are awfully common in different species of moths. Um, sometimes they'll fold the, the top wings and then flash those uh, hind wings so that um, a bird might be startled uh, into leaving them alone because it looks like big eyes but the eye spots on the hind wings are uh, pretty common. But in moths, if they've got feathery antenna, kind of fuzzy bodies, uh, yeah, I think uh, the common name for this one is a poodle moth. Um, this one's an aisle moth, and this is one of the giant silk moths. They are attractive. Okay, here's some that you want to leave alone. We were talking about um, playing with caterpillars and some you can handle safely. Others you should not touch. Um, these are on the do not touch list. There are some stinging caterpillars. Okay, the saddleback, I mean, it's brightly colored. It's very spiny looking. This one you leave alone. Some of them you can have some pretty severe allergic reactions to. And this really weird thing, it's called a hag. And I think monkey slug, slug caterpillars, it's got a couple of common names, but um, the hag moth caterpillar and the, this really fuzzy looking thing that you can just barely see the head on is a puss moth. And it's another one that stings. I'd say of them, yeah. These guys have pretty nasty stings. And the IO moth that was uh, on the previous slide, this is uh, its caterpillar. And it, it's also a stinging caterpillar. So this is these are on the uh, do not touch list. Okay, telling a moth from a butterfly is usually pretty straightforward, but not always. Okay, so this one's a moth. The wings are folded flat, <clears throat> excuse me. 
And this one is a hummingbird moth and it's, uh, its flight does resemble, and if you don't look really carefully, you might think you're looking at a hummingbird, but it's actually a moth. Um, and usually moth antennae are kind of brushy in the males. Some of them um, are a little thicker on the end. But we've got a butterfly here. The wings are folded across the back and the antenna are clubbed. If you have a clubbed antenna and the wings folded over the back, this little skipper um, is in the butterfly group. And usually moths are a little thicker bodied and fuzzier. Okay, wings folded over the back, clubbed antennae, butterfly, clubbed antennae, but they do, you know, open and close the wings. But it, in a resting position, the wings will be closed, but it's clubbed antennae, a little slimmer, it's a butterfly. Now, this is an atypical moth it does have kind of thread-like antennae, but they're not clubbed. It's a little thicker in the body, but this one would be yeah, not the most obvious. So some, some moths do resemble butterflies and vice versa. Okay, here's another huge group, the dipterans. Um, usually the best character, if you can get a good look, is two wings. Most other winged insects are going to have four, but dipterans have only two wings, and they have little halters that are like balancing organs in place of the actual second pair of wings. So the, the front wings are the only, only wing structures in a true fly. Okay, yeah, the term like butterfly, a butterfly is not a fly. Uh, a dragonfly is not a fly, but these guys are flies, real flies. Um, and the mouth parts on flies are variable too. A lot of them have these kind of uh, sponging mouth parts. Some of them have piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, a lot of the flies have these really big eyes. Uh, this is one of the horse or deer flies and they have a blade for a mouth part. They will stab. But this is a crane fly and these are totally harmless. They can't bite. Some people think, oh, it's a giant mosquito. Well, no. Um, if you see something that looks like a giant mosquito, it's a crane fly and it can't bite and it won't hurt. It's harmless. This guy, however, is not. Those things hurt. The horse and deer flies have a nasty bite. Okay, so dipterans, you got house flies, and the eyes are really pretty on this one, but the horse and deer flies have those blade-like mouth parts and they bite. Uh, fruit flies, and from a genetic standpoint, this is also a really important group because lots and lots of genetic studies have been done on fruit flies. Um, and some people call these hover flies or flower flies, and a lot of them look, um, like um, a wasp. They've got uh, black and yellow colorations, but they're not. These guys are harmless. They're flower feeders. Okay, and mosquitoes, which actually do bite. Uh, crane fly, which does not, but they, they do have a similar body shape. War dipterans, and that is a really plumose antenna, very fuzzy, but um, they can pick up smells 
with these really feathery antenna. That's more like a bush. Um, but some of these really small um, dipperins can bite. And this one is a buffalo gnat. Um, they have aquatic larvae, but you can see he's full of blood. And when they swarm, they can be destructive. They can really be uh, a livestock pest and sometimes wildlife pest. But um, some of the aquatic uh, dipterin larvae look like worms, uh, like blood worms. Um, and in this case, these are black flies. But their, their aquatic larvae are fairly common in difference too. But it shows the life cycle on these too. The majority of the life is uh, spent in the water in kind of a, uh, a worm-like form. Oh, yeah. Okay. These are one of the yuck flies. Um, Bot flies will um, parasitize other animals. Um, and in this case, there's it's a human bot fly, which are not here. There's some in South America and there's at least, yeah, there's some in Africa too. But this is what is here. Underneath the skin, you can see just the top, but that is there. And yeah, there are stories of entomologists who have actually found that they were uh, bitten by or infested by, <laughs> attacked by a bot fly and allowed the larva to develop and emerge uh, and then pickled the larva, or pickled the adult rather. Um, and some people call these warble flies. Um, you will see occasionally uh, animals with what looks like a big lump, uh, especially small animals. Um, and it will be one of the bot flies that has laid eggs and the eggs uh, have hatched and the larva have, the maggots have burrowed under the skin to develop. But yeah, bot flies, um, we have a few but we do not have the ones that um, that actually uh, use humans as hosts. You have to go to South America. And the really big group, Coleoptera, uh, they're pretty easy to tell apart usually. Um, they have wing covers, complete wing covers that go all the way to the end of the abdomen in most. So, uh, You've got the shiny hardened elytra. So this is a beetle. Split down the back all the way to the end. This is a beetle. But this one has membranous tips and the covers don't go all the way to the end. And there's this triangular piece right here. This is a stink bug. This is a bug, a hemipteran, not a beetle. Okay, huge group. I, as of right now, it's going to be more than 400,000 described species. Um, some of the common families are ground beetles. This is a ground beetle, uh, the scarab beetle, um, click beetle, uh, the ladybird or lady beetle, and weevils, uh, tiger beetles. Boy, they're fast. They're really speedy and they have impressive, impressive mandibles. They, hunt other insects, just run them down. Um, this one's pretty fast too. It's a ground beetle. Um, fiery searcher is the name and they're really quite attractive, but they have a defense mechanism too. You pick them up and they stink and they can bite, handle with care. And these are recycling beetles, scarab beetles, dung beetles. Um, they will go to um, animal droppings of various sorts. A lot of times you'll find these around pastures, um, cow, horse, and they go um, 
make these balls of dung to lay their eggs in. They usually roll the balls and bury them and lay the egg in them. Um, but they really help um, to decompose and break up uh, animal droppings. In Australia, when they had a whole lot of uh, cattle, they were um, like droppings that weren't uh, breaking down. So they imported beetles, dung beetles from Africa to help them process all the poop from the cattle. Um, but June beetles and uh, the Hercules beetle, some people call them rhinoceros beetles, and they get quite large. Oh, but this is the male, and the male is the one that has the horns, and the females are about the same size with the same markings, but no horn. The males duel for the right to mate. Uh, click beetles are fun, too. This one is one of the larger click beetles. Um, they've got a locking mechanism right behind the um, the, the hind, the head, okay, actually this is the thorax. Between the thorax and the ab abdomen is like a, a, a locking hinge so that if they're frightened, they can fall to the ground. Um, and if they land on their backs, um, they can flip over fast. They're fun to play with. But they make kind of a clicking sound. But this is an eyed click beetle. And um, this one I don't think we have here, but it's got um, a uh, glowing uh, bioluminescent spot on either side of the head. So you've got a glowing click beetle. It's pretty neat. But they're all shaped rather similarly. They're long and narrow, uh, but that flattened indented hinge is a pretty easy giveaway to tell you that you're looking at a click beetle. Okay, almost everybody has seen ladybugs, um, and the Brits call them ladybird beetles, uh, lady beetles. Um, there's a whole bunch of different species. With This one's probably the more common, but the number of spots depends um, on the species, and there's a, a good bit of individual variation, too. But um, they're kind of fun to watch. They are aphid eaters, and some people who garden like to have them around because uh, they munch aphids. And this is actually the immature form uh, before they go, uh, they actually uh, become adults. They look like this, and then they molt and molt. Um, but you're looking at a, an immature lady beetle. And sometimes they overwinter in big groups. And the other easy to ID, we is, uh, ID group is the weevils. Um, and this one is the one there was a real pest around the south. This is a, uh, a boll weevil with a long snoot, but they uh, were an agricultural pest, still are, I guess. Um, but all the weevils have this extended snout with the mouth parts at the end. They are rather comical looking, but um, as a group, there are quite a few that are agricultural pests. See no weevil, hear no weevil. No, you wouldn't hear weevil. Um, okay, and Hymenoptera is another really big group. You got um, of these photos, only one is actually a wasp. So that's a wasp. That is a beetle. Same color pattern or similar color pattern. And if you look closely, shape's wrong, but that's a moth. And even though the yellow and black stripes look 
similar to a wasp. This one is a fly. So you get a fly, a moth, and a beetle all mimicking the wasp who is armed and the others are not. But that black and yellow coloration um, is intended as a warning that, yeah, I can sting, but a lot of other, see, there, there is a proper honeybee. Uh, that's a fly. Got another fly. And here we have a robber fly that looks similar to a bumblebee. Similar markings, but the eyes are wrong and the antennae are wrong. And you've got a bee fly that looks a little like a bee, but it's uh, another mimic. Okay. Um, the wasps, the bees, and the ants can sting. And only the females, but most of, <laughs> most of the ones you come across are going to be females, but the ones uh, that are boys can bite, but only the girls can sting. The females, uh, the sting is a modified uh, egg-laying structure, the ovipositor, um, but they can also use it to defend themselves or um, use it as a weapon. But this one is a pretty good close-up of a fairly long stinger. I think that might be an ant. And there's one of the ants with, yes, a fairly impressive sting. And this, okay, um, is really a wingless wasp. And it's called, um, sometimes a common name is cow killer. Supposedly it hurts so bad you'd think it could kill cows. Um, they're not really aggressive, but if, if you should mess with one, yeah, they are well defended. And it's it's said to be very painful. I've never I've seen them before, but I've never been been stung, not by these. And you've got a cicada killer, and it hunts cicadas and stings them, paralyzes them, and lays eggs in them. Okay, and ants also have imitators. So if you look closely, we've got a couple of, there's the real deal. That's an ant and that's a beetle. The proportions are just a little off, but the colors are pretty close. And in this case, you've got too many legs. One, two, three, four, yeah, eight legs. This is a spider mimicking the ants. And we've got a bug that's an ant mimic. And this one's really obvious too because it has the piercing mouth part of a bug, but it looks a lot like an ant. And this one's another spider mimic, eight legs. And sometimes they do this um, as a defense. It may have more than one purpose as in they look like an ant, therefore you can, you know, be avoided by things that uh, think you could sting them. And sometimes they do this because they want to blend in with the ants. Some of them actually feed on ants. Okay. Um, and the majority of the insects that are social fall into the hymenopterans. Um, and the only other really big social group are going to be the isopterans, the termites. So um, there's the queen of the honeybee hive and queen in wasps. We've got also a female termite. But of the social insects, yeah, the can't think of anywhere off the bat that are not hymenopterans or isopterans. Okay. 
and the hymenopterans um, have a lot of important pollinators. Um, and the honeybees are ones that we use lots. Um, they're not native to North America, but they've been imported and uh, are used agriculturally a lot. But uh, bumblebees and some people that, uh, some places that raise tomatoes actually uh, have to import um, small uh, like groups of uh, bumblebees because bumblebees are uh, buzz pollinators and a lot of tomatoes, the nightshades actually need to be pollinated or the more effective pollinator is going to be a bumblebee. But uh, bumblebees, mason bees, digger bees, uh, quite a few of these are important pollinators. So you can help out by buying or making um, these little tube shelters. They've got uh, some folks have just drilled holes in logs or uh, had uh, bundles of uh, bamboo or dried sticks that they can use to uh, nest in and encourage them to hang around and pollinate your uh, garden. And the vast majority of insects are harmless. Uh, and many of them are beneficial. They're pollinators, they uh, are decomposers, they provide a service. So just swatting things and, uh, okay, butterflies, pretty much nobody doesn't like a butterfly. They may not like the caterpillars, but butterflies are very appealing. And so people keep them as pets and there are places that have insect zoos. I think there's a big butterfly, I don't know if they call it a zoo exactly. And some, some zoos have um, special uh, like enclosures where you can go in and, and um, see butterflies. but they are important food sources for lots of things. Um, specifically, um, anteaters, and they eat pretty much ants and termites. Uh, the echidnas, they eat insects, largely ants and termites. Aardwolves, same thing. Large animals uh, subsisting uh, on pretty much totally insects. And birds, of course, many species of birds uh, are insectivores. And there are quite a few uh, places. Well, let's see, I had Chapolini's, uh, the tacos, grasshopper tacos, they're not bad. Um, and the honeypot ants from uh, the Western part of the US, they, uh, they've been used as a food source. Uh, the individual ants uh, store uh, liquid in some of the individual ants uh, because resources are kind of scarce out west. And quite a few Asian cultures eat a variety of different insects. Uh, there's a place in town, uh, at least a couple of places, that uh, Jerky Store out past the Arlington has um, uh, like mealworms. And I think they've got some of those uh, like candy covered ants and the little lollipops. They're fun novelty items. Okay, if you need to know more, we have an agricultural extension office here in Hot Springs. Uh, Bugguide.net is really good. Uh, if you have an iPhone or if you have a way to use iNaturalist, they're good. And this guy's just fun because he's got a lot of crazy um, um, YouTube videos. Uh, uh, there's a German guy. The insect house is, is uh, his outfit. He's commercial. 
Um, but there are a lot of online insect groups, Arkansas insects, um, but there are a lot of insects that are just really appealing. And you shouldn't just hit them because they look different. Inserts are important and interesting. Okay, let's see. I want to go back to... There you are, Paul. Hey, Belinda. All right. Good, good and very thorough stuff. Yeah, I'm going to recommend too, because the library has some books, and uh, this is uh, local, uh, local folks, 100 insects of Arkansas and the Mid South. That's a really good one. And if you're into butterflies, library has this book too, and by Lori Spencer. And I don't know, but that's my presentation. Ta -da. So I'm going to put your suggestions up there on the screen again, if anyone has any questions in the future. And uh, this program was recorded, so you'll be able to watch this again after the fact. If you tuned in later and want to share it with your friends or anyone else, it'll be here on the library's Facebook and YouTube. Oh, goody. Yes. Well, Belinda, is it, can you think of one more fact that you might have left out that you want to share? Oh, I've got tons of facts. I kind of like the quote she was talking about. Um, after you learn more about insects, you might consider adding native plants to your garden, um, stop using poisons, uh, take greater, greater pleasure in the richness of life that is often right before our eyes. I thought it was kind of a nice quote. Absolutely. And I can tie that into uh, our monthly program with the Master Gardeners as well. Yeah. Because um, I was I was looking online and there was a Master Gardener from California that has an introduction to insects too. It's a lot more in-depth than mine was. But um, yeah, there, there are a number of resources if you're interested to find out more. This was just strictly a, an overview. And let me see if I can get the date of our next uh, Master Gardeners program while I'm thinking of it, since some people might be interested in that as well. On August 17th, the Master Gardeners are presenting on the secret lives of hummingbirds. So oh, if you have a garden, uh, I'm sure you'll the hummingbirds and some insects will coexist. So. Mm -hmm. Well, the... I've seen cute videos where the hummingbird feeder has bees around it too. And the hummingbirds are kind of going, Meh, but <laughs> they ignore them for the most part. But yeah, hummingbirds do eat small insects too. And they use spider webs for making nests. So. And we had a shout out from Nell Ann who said, we enjoyed watching. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for the great program, and we'll see you again next time. What, what do you What do you think you want to do a program on next time? Oh, let's see. Um, if anyone has suggestions, you can leave those in the comments, and I'll pass them her way. Um, I've got the snake program. I've got the tree program. That I uh, there was an, there were. An, the most people, I guess, were interested in the trees and the snakes and the wildflowers. So any, any or all. All right. So let us know what your preference is that you'd want to see first out of those three. And uh, Belinda will join us again here in a month or two. Okay. All right. Have a good night. Thanks.